Would you, uh, would you pray? pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning, this day that you have given us, God. This day that is a gift, God. We don't, uh, we, we didn't do anything to earn this day, but given out of your grace to us to live and grow and become more like you today by the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that we would be humble learners this morning, that I would preach with clarity, God, with conviction, God, and we would not just have ears to hear, God, but also be doers of your word. Lord, we ask all of these things in the powerful name of your Son, in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we've come through this season of COVID, we're not through it in its entirety. We don't know what that would even look like. But as we've been in it for a long time and have gone through incredible turmoil, both locally, nationally, internationally, and I'm sure in your own families as well during this time, chances are that you have had moments where the faith that you have and the faith that you once had, that great trust of God and burning desire to accomplish, it's possibly wrong. It could be that you are in one of those moments, one of those seasons right now. And while the, the past several years have presented events that don't even happen in some people's generations, the winds of adversity are not unique to us. Generation after generation of faithful believers have experienced adversity. We're in good company. I think about the prophet Elijah, discouraged to the point of wanting to be done with life. I think about Hannah, crying every day because of the barrenness that haunted. We think of David, broken because of his sin. So many saints have gone through times where their faith wasn't blazing, but was a, but was a flicker in the nights. This morning we're going to be beginning a series called Keep Going, where we're looking at the wisdom and the encouragement that the Apostle Paul has for Timothy. Not in the middle of a sunny day, not in the middle when... Not in the middle of a time when everything is going well, but when Paul's very life is about to, to burn out. When Timothy is about to experience his absence in the midst of growing persecution. If you turn with me to 2 Timothy, the title of this morning's message is Claim to Flame. Claim to Flame. But we're going to look at where this flame of faith is given from and what we are to do with it as faithful followers of Jesus. But as we begin this book, we have to understand the context. Paul is in prison, in Rome, and Paul is sort of an expert at being in prison. He, he was in prison a lot. Uh, but this time it's different, because he's acutely aware that his soon coming trial will most likely result in death. And not just a, a simple, quick, easy thing. You see, the, the leader of Rome, the emperor, his name was Nero, and chances are you've heard of him because he's crazy and did a lot of, of really messed up things. There was a, a fire in Rome, and people speculate that he may have started it. And it went on for roughly six days, killed hundreds of people, displaced thousands, and, and he blamed the fire on Christians. And since he was emperor, he didn't really need to get anyone's permission or public approval to do anything. He didn't need to launch a social media campaign. He just started rounding up Christians and killing them. He would feed them to the lions, crucify them. He would even use them as burning torches, lighting the way of the road. So this is what could be on Paul's mind as he's in prison about what awaits 
end? Or is this what's in Paul's mind? I want to, to read together 2 Timothy chapter 1, the first seven verses. Paul writes this, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in, in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Paul's thoughts are not centered on his problems. He's got far more than 99, let's be clear. He's got a lot of problems going on. He's not centered on his problems. From the very introduction of this letter, we see where his focus lies. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. You see, where we end our letters with our name, letters in the first century were started with an introduction, where someone might drop their titles or what you need to know about them. We see that Paul has not lost sight of God's call on his life. What he wants to announce about himself, first and foremost, is that he is a messenger of the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus. Beginning in the, in the end of the statement, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the light that is in Christ Jesus. The Alpha and Omega, if you will, of Paul's he's, he's wanting Timothy to know, I'm a messenger of the news of Christ Jesus, not by my own will. I didn't just get here on my own, get here in prison, by the way, not in great circumstances by any means. I didn't just get here on my own, but it's because God met me on the road to Damascus and changed my life forever. Amen. The words according to could also be translated to, to further. He understands that the call on his life is to further the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Here he is on, on death's doorstep, desiring to further the life that is in Christ Jesus. He isn't just thinking about himself and his call. He's not launching off from here to say, this is what I'm going through, Timothy, and this is what's happening in my life. He goes from this introduction to address to him in verse 2. To Timothy, my beloved child. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy, this, this man that Paul had discipled for years, with whom he had done a tremendous amount of ministry, the, the man that he wrote this about in Philippians, he, he wrote this, he said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Listen to what he says, for I have no one like you who will be genuinely concerned for your love. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. Amen. Timothy, this, this man who knew conflict in the home, his father was not a follower of Jesus, was a Hellenistic Greek, but his grandmother and his mother were followers of Jesus. They were devout Jews. Timothy, who's serving at the church in Ephesus, a, a church that Paul loved dearly. A church where when Paul left and he said, I'm not going to see you again, Acts tells us that there were so many tears as they parted one another. Timothy, the, the man who was circumcised for the sake of the gospel. We don't know where Timothy's faith is at in this moment. We don't know if he's full of faith. Energized, ready to go. 
But I speculate, I assume that it might not be your with vigor at this point. That, that Paul might know Timothy, Timothy could be struggling on might be struggling soon when he finds out what happens. I wonder if Paul is concerned that his faith might be waning. Wherever Timothy is at, he hears these words spoken to him. Timothy, my beloved, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus. Paul wants him to know, Timothy, I love you, Paulus. We weren't just co-laborers. You're, you're, you're like a son to me, like a beloved son. And I want you to know the grace and the mercy and the peace that is from God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the church, I want us to receive those words this morning as well. I want you to hear that introduction like it's written to you. Tasha. You're deeply loved by God. I want us to know the grace and the mercy and the peace of God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Tracy, you're deeply loved by God. Wherever you're at in life, I want you to know that if you are in Christ Jesus, you are deeply loved. And I want you to know the grace and the mercy and the peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. But Paul doesn't move on from here and say, that's enough. I said some kind words to Timothy. Now let me tell him about what's going on in my life. But he tells him what he's been thinking, praying, what's on his mind. Paul says this in verse 3. He says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you as well. Imagine to me hearing these words. Not only are you loved, but I am here in prison thinking about and thanking God for your life. And I'm doing this all the time. It's not just a randomly, oh man, I wonder how Timothy's doing. This is constantly on my mind. I'm thinking about you and I'm thanking God for you. In one sentence, Timothy is hearing that he is remembered, that he is prayed for, and that God is being thanked for his life. One of my favorite practices is praying through the people in our congregation. And it might seem sort of formulaic. I have a list that I go through. It. I just pray through the list. And oftentimes I'll take scripture that I'm reading, scripture like this, as sort of a guide. And I might use this, and I might say, I thank God, and I'll list the people. And it's interesting that as you do this, there's something that happens. And it makes sense that by the fact that we're given the Holy Spirit who unifies us. But in praying for one another, I find my, my heart getting knit together with you as a congregation. I, I find myself longing for and concerned about what's going on in your life and lifting up one another to, to our God, remembering. And I can resonate a little bit with Paul and his, his heart of, of remembering and being reminded of and thinking for and longing for the people of God. And I would encourage you, this isn't just a task for pastors. This isn't just a task for leaders. I would encourage you. It might be three people. But write it down. Maybe put it on your fridge. But pray consistently. And from time to time just maybe send a text or a call and say, hey, I'm praying for you. How are you doing? Because you're letting that person know you're being thought of. You're being thanked for. You're being prayed for. And I don't know about you, but we all need that. It's, it's good to know that people are thanking God for you because you can sometimes feel like, man, I'm just a mess. <laughs> I feel like I'm probably more of a problem than I help. And you hear some say, no, I'm thanking God for you. You can change the trajectory of your week. Maybe even your month, to be honest. Paul doesn't 
just remember to you with something specific about it. He says in verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Paul is saying, as I'm, as I'm here in prison, and as I'm thinking and praying for you, I am thinking and praying about the, the genuine faith that you have. This, this active trusting of God, this trusting of the, the person and the promises of God is revealed by the Son. This, this faith that receives the grace of God given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. This faith that, that looks like repenting of sin and turning to the Son and following Him. Paul is saying, I'm thinking about your faith. I want you to know it's genuine. It's not, it's not a hypocritical faith. This word genuine is, is basically meaning like without a mask. Because the actors at the time would put on masks as they would do plays. And they would be somebody else. And they would perform their part. And then when they were done, they would take off the mask. And it would be the, the real person, no longer the actor. And, and Paul's saying, you don't have to take off the mask. You're the real deal. Your faith is genuine. There's no putting on the Christian facade and then when Timothy goes home, it's, he's a completely different person. There's a genuineness to your faith. I was thinking about this and thinking about the difference in candles. I have a couple here. You guys know these candles. <clears throat> like, they give light. They do a lot of the things that candles are supposed to do. It's very just like static and it stays the same. There's no really burning out until electricity's gone. But I don't know about you, but I don't ever really enjoy these sorts of candles. Like if I go into a restaurant and they have all of these on the table, I'm not particularly impressed. I'm not particularly like, man, this is so warm and cozy. I'm sorry if you have these candles in your house. That's what it's much safer. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not like, oh man, I'm just sitting next to this candle. It's so amazing. But then there's something like this. Like with a, a real wick. Let me put the mic down for a moment. I tried to blow this out earlier with a mask on. There's so much more of a life to this. See, this is, this is genuine right here. This isn't just putting on a facade and saying, like, I want to be a candle. I'm sort of like a candle. There is a, a life to this, a vitality to this. And sure, it might get larger and it might uh, wane, but there's a, 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 a dynamic to it that's far different from this. And our faith is similar. As I was thinking about this, I thought you could call this religion. Like believing the right set of doctrines, checking off the right boxes, always the same. Hey, this is what I believe, this is just what I do, and this is who I am. But there's no life in it. Nobody's saying, I really want to just curl up next to this because it's so cozy. But this, there's a life. And we're not just called to believe in a certain set of doctrines, and I thank God for doctrine. It's so necessary for us to know what to believe, and there's power in it. But we're given the power of the Holy Spirit to be in a relationship with God. And one of the, the risks of a relationship is that sometimes, sometimes it's strong and sometimes it's not, and God knows that. Would he rather have a relationship with you than just say, yes, I just adhere to all of these things? He'd rather have a, a life-giving relationship in which he is participating with you by his Holy Spirit. Amen. A vibrant faith. We've been given the flame of God. Sorry, we've been given the flame from God. Flame of God and from God through people. Yeah. See, Paul places both his faith and Timothy's faith in a lineage, alerting him that you might be discouraged about what you're in. 
You might be down. You might be doubting where it's come from. But I want you to know that you've come from something. You've come from some genuine followers of Jesus. He lets us know about Timothy's legacy. The faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And beloved, I want you to know that you've come from someone. And maybe it's, it's not that someone specifically led you to the Lord. You, you might have encountered Jesus in such a way that it was boom. But I guarantee that there have been people in your life that have helped pass on that flame from God. You've come from someone. Timothy came from a grandmother, grandma of the faith, a mother of the faith. I praise God that our faith is filled with amazing women. Women who might not have had the, the luxury of studying in the halls of academia about God, but women who were faithfully serving and following Jesus in so many different ways. They might not have been given the, the, the privilege of writing treaties of all these things about God, but they knew God. Women who've passed that on to their kids and to their community. I was reading a story about the mother of Cesar Chavez, who was the head of the, the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. Her name is Mama Tea Chavez, and, and author was saying she, she was the theologian of the family. And Cesar wrote this, he said, Mama Tea gave us a, a formal religious training. She was always praying, just praying. And every evening she would sit in bed and we would gather in front of her. And after the rosary, she would tell us about a particular saint and drill us on our catechism. And he talked about his mother. And he said, my mom would find some needy person to help. And until recently, she would always invite people to the house, usually hobos. She would go out purposely to look for someone in need, give him something, and never take anything in return. And I love this story of, of, from their family about when the kids were getting their first communion. Because they lived like 20 miles from Yuma. And at that time in the mid-1900s, this was a trek. And so mother brought them to, to the priest for the first communion. And he wouldn't let them take it. Because they hadn't received official church-sanctioned catechism training. And the mom said, I didn't come 20 miles to walk away without them receiving their first communion. And so she said, ask them. Ask them anything you want. And he proceeded to ask question after question after question. And the kids responded with the truth of God. And he just sort of sat there like, we might not have trained you formally, but you have been educated in the ways of God. And that's when those kids got their first thing. And it's a different tradition than ours, but I think it's a powerful example that the, the faith given from God comes through people. And I wonder who are the people in your life who passed on the faith to you? Maybe reach out, maybe say, say thank you. Give them a text, give them a call, say, I want to thank you for the faith that you've passed on. Who are you passing? This, this candle's not going to light anything. That's why it's safe. This can light something. Yeah. This can light Everything. some more candles. <laughs> we can light a lot of this. But I think especially lately I've been thinking about most of us who are young parents. Yeah. So good to have Avery with us. <laughs> Makes me a lot more nervous. This is her first sermon and she's here in person. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but there's so much info that we get about everything. Every little detail of being a parent and birthing and nursing and sleeping and not sleeping. Everything. People have so many thoughts and ideas. And sometimes what can get lost is how am I going to, to pass on my faith to my child? How am I going to, to teach them that which is most precious to me and that which Peter says is, is more precious than gold? How am I going to how do I want that to, to be displayed for them day in and day out? To those with no kids, who's in your life? 
to pass the blame of God. What does that look like? How will you pass it on? You've been given the blame from God through you. It's with that lineage in mind that Paul continues and writes this. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you to the laying on of my hands. See, Tim, you've been given the flame from God, through people. Keep it going. Keep it going. While you're reading scripture, you'll notice transitional phrases. And I circled one here. You can go to the next slide. And I circled it with a, a pen, just to see, like, I'm not the, the most neat circler. If I draw lines, I take the cross out part of the verse, and I'm okay with that. Like, that's just, it's not super organized, but I, I write a lot in books that I read, in scripture. And I would encourage you, as you're reading, to circle or to highlight these transitional phrases, because it will really help uh, the understanding of, okay, so, so for what reason? For this reason, it alerts you to, to look back. Okay, for the reason that this, this faith has been given from God through people, for this reason, I remind you. Now he's calling Timothy to bring to Timothy. Timothy, I've been thinking a lot about you. I want you to take some time to think about your faith. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying out of my hands. Paul's saying, I was there. I, I was confirming what God had done in your life. I can tell you that faith is genuine. Now, I want you to, to fan it into flame. I don't know about you, but I love fires. I love being around fires. Uh, this, you don't like fires? I don't know if I get burned. Man, sorry. Watch it from a distance. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's it. This weather is really not conducive to fires. It's still, like, hot and muggy. I needed to, to drop a few degrees. Um, but you know that, that point in a fire where it's starting to, to wane, and you, you have a decision ahead of you. Am I going to throw on more logs and just get it, like, massive and burning again? Or am I going to let it sort of die out? Or maybe you left the fire for a little bit, and it was massive. And you thought, this is going to last for a long time. And then you come back, and it's just like a tiny little flame. Though. And you're like, man, I can't just throw a log on this fire. I'm going to crush it. So you have to be a lot more delicate. You have to blow on it very gently. If you're going to fire with James, I would say, James, can you help the fire, please? And I'd like to make sort of navigate this. Through the fire. But it, it needs some help to keep going. Yeah, I do. And Paul's using this analogy in his faith. So I want you to, to fan into flame the gift of God. I don't want you to neglect it. I don't want you just to assume that it's going to go on forever and you can, you can do whatever you want. I want you to fan into flame. And maybe that looks like throwing another log of... I'm on this log of getting in the Word, and, and I'm going to study this book, and I'm going to, to really get into it. I'm going to grab some people and do it together. Maybe that's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to get in a small group. I need to start doing life with other people. And you throw a log under that plant to make sure that it continues to grow. But it could be that you're coming back and saying, that flame is And it could be that all you can do right now in this moment is just get Whatever it is, I, I, I ask you, I encourage you, I, I plead with you, fan into flame the gift of God because it's the most precious thing that we have. You've been given the flame from God. Through people, keep it going. By the Spirit. By the Spirit. The last verse, verse 7, says this, For God, Gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. I've circled it for, uh, again, uh, another transitional state. For causing you to, to look back. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For, for the reason being, God gave us a spirit. Not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Beloved, I thank God that I'm not sending the 
himself in you today. Telling you, go do this on your own. Go do this. You have it in you to fan that flame. I'm not telling you to look inside of yourself and you'll find power and strength and love. If you just look inside of yourself, you're not going to find enough power and enough strength and enough love to, to accomplish this. What I'm telling you to do is go forth from you by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. Not of timidity, not of shrinking back from what God has for you. But the spirit of, the spirit of an accomplishing power, a power that, that achieves its purpose in your life. To go forth from here in the spirit of love, an agape love, an unconditional love. To go forth from here in, in the spirit of self-control, of having a mind that's sound, choosing what is best for you in each and every situation. might be burning bright and you say, I want to pass this on. Who's, who's someone that I can pass this on? Can, can I get some help? And we want to help you as a church. You might say, look, I, I don't even know what it would look like for me to, to serve and use the gift that God has given me and I, and I want to use that. And we would love to help with that as a church. So what are you gifted in my God? Be passionate about this. How can you use that for His kingdom? So we're going to take a little bit of the time. We're going to play a song and then have to 